Good morning, Bitcoins. My name is Thomas Hunt, and we're here with Nicholas Berthe from Galois. How's it going, Nicholas? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. So I know you guys are doing incredible things down there in El Salvador. I've heard about Bitcoin Beach, uh, but maybe just tell me from the start, how did it start out? Were you living mm -hmm. in El Salvador? How did you get the idea to combine El Salvador and the Lightning Network? Yeah, so the project starts before I was involved, actually. So the project starts about two years ago, where some crazy guy, one of them is called Mike Peterson. He actually has been living in El Salvador for the last 15 years. Um, he said, you know, he's a Bitcoiner and said, hey, like, it's probably a good place to start trying to get a, a local Bitcoin economy. And he, he started two years ago with a do an anonymous donor that gives some fund to the community. And it really starts with the idea that, hey, you know, like, we can use Bitcoin as money. And it's not that crazy as it sounds. And, you know, it, it go from like being a local community project to, you know, a country running on, on the Bitcoin standard. So it obviously grew pretty quickly and pretty fast and, and faster than, you know, what anybody anticipated at the beginning. So my, my journey it started into started out, did you have very many businesses that accepted business uh, that accepted Bitcoin or did it start out with just one? So initially, it started, and I was not involved for the, you know, the first year, basically. But the way it started is, so every people in the village receive some Bitcoin, you know, think like 10, 20 dollar in Bitcoin. Initially, it was on a non-chain wallet, the blockchain.com wallet. Uh, and the idea was just to let say, hey, you know, let's send some Bitcoin to, to the people in the community and let's see if people start using it. This initial grant, I would say, was not the most successful because basically people receive it for free. And if it's something you receive for free, it doesn't have value. And so, you know, people, you know, just like say, okay, thank you for whatever you give me. I, I, I'll take some cash with it. And, and that's nice. And, you know, thank you for your gift, right? Um, they, they did the same kind of thing at MIT one time. They dropped a whole bunch of Bitcoin on all the students back when Bitcoin was not that valuable. And all the students kind of had to do was hold this gift, right? Say, hey, cryptocurrency, yeah. maybe it go up, maybe it goes down, right? School gave it to me for free. They all sold it for like $300 for beer money. And yeah, it's worth thousands of dollars now. And it's again, it's that marshmallow problem. You give someone the marshmallow and they're just like, you should eat that now. Yes, thank you. Thank you for it. <laughs> That's a nice gift. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 and after the project shift more with like, instead of, um, you know, giving it for free, you know, let, let's have some of the people from the community that are doing, you know, things for the community and they are being paid with Bitcoin. And this is really how, I guess, people start to see the value in Bitcoin because now they receive it, you know, for their payment and, you know, they can see its money. And in parallel to that, merchants start accepting Bitcoin in, in, in Azonte, where Bitcoin Beach started. And this is probably around the time I, on my side, start contributing to the, to the project. So initially, the wallet that was being used was the blockchain.com wallet, which is an on-chain wallet. So the reason it did not work very well is because of the on-chain fees. Like, you, you cannot really do a 10 dollar transaction with an on-chain wallet you know it's like not only it costs a lot of fees but also it's slow and you know it's not not an efficient way to pay uh, your restaurant bill uh, and after that the day the, when, when we used to try to get people to take bitcoin we would try to wait around and you'd have to wait around for the confirmations before you could leave with a restaurant and if it was if yeah. you're trying to buy something huge like a lamborghini or a ferrari or whatever they just won't let you leave. You just have to stay there, confirmation after confirmation. It's like Coinbase over there, just so many confirmations. So yeah, I could see them having a problem with that in El Salvador. Yeah, yeah. And also it's not deterministic, right? You don't know if the next block will be in the next minute or next hour or like- Yeah, um... 10 minutes on average is no good if you're trying to do, imagine a fast food, you're going through the drive-through and it's like, oh yeah, 10 minutes or you know, whenever on average. I'll send you the money. <laughs> yeah, and I believe overall it might be not as much a 
confirmation time. That was really an issue because I guess most people will accept like a non-confirmed transaction, you know, like you need to be, you know, this can be gamified for sure, right? It's like, uh, and you can double respond it, but I guess people were not trying to, you know, double respond here in the community. Uh, the main burden probably was on the fees side, right? Like, you know, the fees market is very volatile, right? It's, it's a much more volatile market than the, you know, the price of Bitcoin is, right? It can go from, it, it has been from $60 a transaction three months ago, four months ago now to like, you know, five cents, right? So like there has been a, a thousand X decrease in the, this year, like in 2021, right? Um, and, and anyway, so the, the community moved to another wallet called Wallet of Satoshi, which is a you know a, a custodial wallet this time, and that used Lightning. And, and suddenly, with Wallet of Satoshi, okay, like you get some nice property because it's instant, and you know it's 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 free most of the time, like if you use Lightning. And so, you know, this is where I guess the community start to appreciate. Oh, okay, you can actually use Bitcoin for payment. Maybe not layer one, maybe use layer two. And probably most of the people here don't necessarily comprehend the difference between layer one and layer two, but they can see that you know this new wallet just works and is instant and is low fee and let, yeah let's let's use that. And this is where I got involved with the project. I, I wanted to build a community bank, like you know, software for developing community bank on top of Bitcoin, right? Uh, and generally software for Bitcoin banking. And I was living in the US at the time, and I was looking for a project to be able to, to do the software side, right? So I was looking for a community that were, that were already using Bitcoin. And so I reached out to the community here and said, you know, I, I can help you develop your own wallet so you can get all the insight about, you know, is it being used? And, um, you know, if someone have an issue with a wallet, we can provide support because we know what's happening. Uh, and, and really, I, Having the community having their own wallet is has been a huge driver for for them to adopt it because they feel it's it's their own right. It's a big on beach wallet. It started here. If there is issue, they can talk to people locally, and so it, it really brings this trust element that you know, you know has been uh, very uh, helpful to, to 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 the success of the Bitcoin Beach project. That might also be a model for future projects like this, not just having people go in, like I know people talked all the time about Dash and these other currencies that they had, you know, Burger King and these restaurants were taking it, but then they didn't have that community support. And even back in the day, they had this amazing event that BitPay put on called the Bitcoin Bowl. And it was a college football game and they'd sponsored it. And they went around, they got all the businesses to take Bitcoin, but they didn't have the community. They didn't come back. They didn't eat there each week, each, you know, for a month and all this stuff the tablets got lost, the instructions went away. You really need that kind of people on the ground that you can trust. And then you need that community to keep going back and to keep shopping. Uh, what about with Bitcoin Beach? Did people have trouble moving in and out of their wallet? Say if they had too much money in their wallet, they needed to cash out. Would they be able to do it with friends or did a little community of money changers form? Uh, it's a great question. So early on, there was an ATM in, in Elzonte, the village where Bitcoin Beach started. Uh, and it's, it's funny because there was a Bitcoin ATM, but there is still today no bank ATM, right? So if I have Bitcoin, I can get cash and vice versa. But if I have a, a debit card or credit card, I, I cannot get cash here. Like it's really a Bitcoin-driven economy. Uh, and so the, the ATM has been you know, a key part to help people cash out. Interestingly, though, you know, I believe there is more people buying Bitcoin than selling Bitcoin, you know, as ATM, like because you know, I guess Bitcoin has been people understand Bitcoin here, you know, more and more, and you know, when you understand it, you typically want to have more of it, whether less of it, right? Uh, but but the ATM can go both ways. There is also, uh, as you, you know, suggested, a local economy where, you know, the what the merchant, you know, where the merchant are that accept Bitcoin. And, and if you want to, to, to buy Bitcoin, you can also see the merchant, you know, and say, hey, you know, do you have some, so, some Bitcoin that, you know, you want to sell and you know, I can give you some cash. And so there is this local economy also going off of peer-to-peer -peer trading. It's interesting to think about how much this has changed, how previously, if you were talking to a merchant, you were like, hey, give me my change back in Bitcoin. You're talking about a complicated process. All the blocks have to go through the confirmations, the fees. 
But with Lightning, it really is maybe even easier just to scan the person's wallet, say $2.87. It shoots it back to you rather than counting out the change. And as long as people are okay with taking it, I could see it really going forward. Uh, it's interesting how you know what was so difficult back then is now so much easier with a Lightning Network. Now, you mentioned before the chat that you found a place to eat. What kind of things have you bought lately with a Lightning Network? And is it like you walk down the street and everything takes it? Is there a Bitcoin neighborhood or how's it going on that, that level? Yes, yeah, so I don't use my credit card here or cash. I so I, I've been over the last uh, six weeks in in Elzonte and in San Salvador. In Elzonte, I every day is lightning. I use it for everything. Right, you can use it to buy food and go to the restaurants. Um, you know, even the doctor here is taking lightning, uh, and you you can do pretty much a, everything you want with with lightning here, and it, almost everybody accepts it. The the only few, and that is a very interesting insight. The only few businesses that don't accept it are the luxury, uh, you know, business here. So some of the couple of high end restaurants and high end hotel, they, they don't really accept Bitcoin, or at least like it's not easy to pay with Bitcoin. And it all comes back to the fact that, um, you know, they don't need to because they already have a credit card payment terminal. And I guess most of the people are tourists that pay with credit cards. So they don't they don't see a need for Bitcoin. But here, every every smaller shop, every chanda, uh, basically, they most of them did not have a bank account before. And, you know, this, this Bitcoin wallet is their first, you know, like, bank account or you know electronic money system that they have and so they they are incentivized to use lightning um, because otherwise the alternative is use cash and you know cash have good finality property uh you know instant settlement but beyond that it's like not the it's not easy to pay you know your water bill with cash right you know, or, or or to pay your electricity bill or um uh, and so they yeah, basically, Bitcoin here is adopted by the poor people, right? People with lower income first, and and it's going up the stack, right? Uh, which is like I I would think it's probably the opposite in the US. I mean, I mean in the US it's used by everyone, I believe. But you know, uh, uh, the main use case I see in the US is like protection against inflation, right? And so. Uh, typically, it makes sense when you have wealth, right? When you uh, you want to preserve your wealth, and, and you will not use it as a medium of exchange, right? You will use it as a store of value. Here, the main use case is medium of exchange and then store of value. But 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 it's very interesting to see how yeah such a different perspective there would be from using Bitcoin in El Salvador versus the US. Well, it sounds like almost a metaphor for Bitcoin adoption and why it continues to be slow, so slow in the US and in the developed countries. When you say in, in El Salvador, the poor are using it, the poor neighborhoods are using it, but the wealthy restaurant has no problem. Everyone has a credit card, credit cards work fine. Uh, the system we have here in the US, the debit, the credit card, the cash, it works fine. Most people don't have trouble transacting. Most people have bank accounts. So they don't really need Bitcoin in the same way. Like I, I like that you say most people have Bitcoin. I think most people in the US kind of know about Bitcoin now. Many of them still think it's too confusing, like Senator Ted Cruz and others. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think in El Salvador, it could be a survival technique. This could be like you're saying, you don't have a bank account. You don't want to go fill out forms. It's much more onerous, I imagine, to get a bank account in another country. Uh, but you get this Bitcoin wallet. Uh, you register now. Now, how does that work for, for Galois? Do they register? Do they write down their words? Do they have a backup of their wallet? Uh, what's that like? Yeah, so the Bitcoin Beach wallet that is developed by Galo is what we, what I would call a, a shared custody wallet. So really from the experience of the user, it's a custodial wallet where they will need to Currently, they need their phone number, and you know they uh, they will receive a text and they use their text, and um, and this is how they will register to to the wallet. Um, and in the back end, the the reason I said it's a shared custody wallet is because the community have the key of the multi sig. So, it, 
it's developed similarly to an exchange when you have the hot wallet and the hot wallet, you know, is the key are on a server and, you know, it's a lightning wallet basically that is used to make the payment. But only a minimal amount of funds are in this hot wallet. The major part of the fund are like an exchange, you know, in the cold storage, multi C, because this is how you, you know, you, you secure your fund, right? You want major part of the fund to be in this in this wallet. Um, and, and the community here have the key for this wallet, right? Which is something very powerful that you, you will not be able to do with fiat system, right? You can only do this because Bitcoin have cryptographic property and you can have like, a, you know, N out of M multi sig solution. And, and you can have people in the ground having the, you know, the, the, the key for the fund. And so there is still a lot of trust assumption, obviously, like it's, it's not a, a, a non-custodial wallet, um, but it's a trade-off where, you know, because the community of the fund, like, you know, you, you're still trusting some people here, uh, but it's people you know, right? So it's it's a very different trust assumption. Well, I'm, I'm not a complete hardliner. I don't think everyone has to hold all their keys all the time. I do like the idea if you lose your phone, if you lose your phone number, there's some kind of way that you can get back into your wallet. Is that what they gain by this? And, and who is the community that has the key? Because I've seen others shared things like once upon a time, there was a Dogecoin tip bot and the Dogecoin tip bot company uh, kept losing money. And then pretty soon they dipped into the tips and they dipped into the tips some more. And then pretty soon there was no more tips and there was no more tip bot and everyone forgot about it. But uh, what's to stop that from happening with your community? Yeah, so something we want to do uh, is proof of reserve. Um, so the idea of proof of reserve is to show that all the liability, you know, to the customer, so all people that send some Bitcoin to this wallet, it is being covered by, you know, the ETX who said that, I guess, the wallet have, right? Uh, and it's something that I believe would be good for the industry to generally adopt. And it's something that we have been working on. Uh, it's still not in the wallet, but I believe this is the best proof, you know, to the, the best proof to show that hey, someone is not draining like day over day the fund of, 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 of the bank account and actually the, you know, the wallet is being uh, not, is not sol uh, solvable, right? I think it's a, we see this happening many places in, the, I mean, in history, in the Bitcoin history many times. Um, yeah, uh, one way to prevent that is to do proof of reserve. I definitely like to see more companies offering that. It was a long time ago, Kraken said they were going to look into that, but then they never actually did it. I think a lot of people are worried if you show your reserve, you're exposing your security problem or even exposing the number of Bitcoins makes the company a target for hacking, uh, things like this. It's reasonable. I can understand what they're saying from a security perspective. But then, like you're saying, part of the magic of crypto is that we really can prove that you have the money and you can't necessarily steal it just by being able to prove it. So- Yeah, and, uh, and I believe right. the uh, analytics company today can easily, you know, they know how much Kraken has, they know how much Coinbase has, like there is some heuristics you can use to, to understand, okay, this transaction is going to the cold storage of this, you know, custodian and, and so I, I understand the idea of, yeah, like some company doesn't want to expose, um, public is a reserve, but one, there is, you know, you, you can deduce that from looking at on-chain transaction. And second, I believe there might be a way to do proof of reserve using zero knowledge proofs that may not require to disclose your reserve but also. I think we'll see that in the future, more things like that, but it's all, you have to develop that 1.0 system before you can develop the more complicated system. A lot of people are like, why isn't Bitcoin all anonymous and encrypted? And it's like, well, it was really difficult to develop the Bitcoin as an idea anyway, let alone doing it anonymous and encrypted on the first try and perfectly. And then now with it, with all these people's money in it, you want to be very careful, that kind of thing. So what's life uh, like for you in El Salvador? How does it compare to where you used to live before? I can say that it's different from life in California, for sure, uh, where I've spent the last, you know, couple of years. Um, so first, like, there is different lifestyle here, whether you live at Bitcoin Beach in El Zonte or whether you live in the capital city is 
also very different, right? So in, in Bitcoin Beach, uh, so it's it's a town that is, you know, beachfront as the name suggests. And so here we see, a, a, you know, Bitcoiner coming every week and like it's it, it's it's like a rolling meetup, rolling bit, Bitcoin meetup, which is fairly nice. So I, I came to, you know, to meet a lot of, of Bitcoiner here over the last, uh, yeah, the last couple of weeks and months I've been there. Uh, it, it's a, otherwise a surf town. So a lot of people come here to surf. There is some of the best waves in Central America here, which is how like all, all the people that were originally here before really Bitcoin took off, like they are all either local people or foreigners that are, you know, in, into surf basically. Um, otherwise, like the infrastructure here is not as developed as you know in 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 other more developed country like the world there are still you know there, there are still many world with dirt and if you want to go to a supermarket like there is no supermarket in the village so you need to take the car and you know drive like 15 minutes um but 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 it's a it, it, it's a it's a great place to be the beach is beautiful you know the food are great the people are are just so funny but it's a great place to, to be currently. There is no, I would say, no vaccine passport or stuff like that, right? So life is easy also. And uh, so, yeah, I, I like it being there. Uh, what's the internet like? Do you have good internet on your cell phone? Do you have good internet at your apartment, at your work? Uh, what are the conditions there? So internet is is okay. It's not, it's not great. Um, there are days, you know, not not days, but there are like hours when there is no internet. It happened a couple of times per month uh, where internet will cut for half an hour to half a day. Um, so typically, if that happened, it will be the uh, you know the cable will not will go down, but internet on the phone will work. Um, so yeah, in in. I mean, this is not where you have the best internet on the earth, uh, you know, and it come back to the infrastructure, right? Infrastructure is not, it's not the best infrastructure of the world. Um, hopefully the Bitcoin law will change that, like, you know, it will help having more investment and making this place like you know, a, a, a better place by having investment in infrastructure. It's interesting the way a lot of countries are kind of leapfrogging the traditional internet and going to much more cellular internet and then Wi-Fi once you get from the cellular to the Wi-Fi for the local area, uh, this kind of thing, we're seeing that roll out rather than the traditional fiber and the heavy cable and all that, which is good sometimes, but like you're saying, reliability, uh, good speeds, uh, yeah, you're not going to get it. So what was the process? Was it Bitcoin Beach first, then they became a uh, accepted as legal tender? Uh, were you guys just on the beach, you know, trading it for seafood and this kind of thing and the president rolls up in his car uh what what kind of happened uh, so it, it really starts with bitcoin beach definitively and it started two years ago and you know the law was only passed two months ago so like uh, it, it for sure starts with bitcoin beach and and eventually i believe the success of bitcoin beach was one of the key elements that uh make you know the president and the country generally like aware of Bitcoin and the potential of Bitcoin and how we can help on financial education, financial inclusion, and why you know the president ultimately decided to 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 do this Bitcoin law. Um, it it really started here. No, no, it's like beyond you know beyond this town, right? It's it's uh, so this is a town of three thousand people here in El Zonte, and there is six million people in El Salvador. So now it's you know obviously like it's it's no longer you know, Bitcoin in El Salvador is no longer Bitcoin Beach only. It's like it's it's the whole country, um, and and so to to dive a little bit into this, so the the law was passed about two months ago, and the law is only active next month on September seven. So currently, the business you know still have time to accept it and to figure out how to integrate with into Lightning. I believe by September 7, you know, very few business, especially the larger business, will be ready to accept Lightning because it's just like it takes time. Uh, you know, there is we need to invest a lot in the in the tooling to have like 
point of sale terminals that can work with Lightning and how to integrate with all the ERPs that you know all the business have here. Like this takes time. It's not like something that you do overnight, right? Uh, but I believe in the next maybe six months, you know, most merchants should accept it, and and this is where the Bitcoin economy will really start to roll out. Um, and it's very exciting to, to to see, to wait and see, you know, how how adoption will play out. It, it's probably I've, important I've to. Heard, I've heard yeah. on one side that the law requires it, and you must accept Bitcoin. But I've also heard on the other side, maybe if you were very remote and you don't have any internet. There's a bunch of loopholes. Uh, how serious is that? Like you mentioned, the the big businesses, it's going to take time. Are they all going to adopt it? It's going to take time. Or are they going to kick the can down the road? And you know, is it how serious is this law? So, so the law is very short and well written. Um, there is like an article, I believe, twelve that says that if you don't have the technical ability, you know, you are not required to accept it. Um, uh, and there is two ways to interpret it. You know, there is a way you mentioned, which is, hey, if you if you don't have a smartphone and you know you you're in a remote location, you don't have internet, sure, you may not accept it. I have an, an additional way to interpret it is that if you're a big business and you don't have the infrastructure to accept it at scale, you know, maybe you will not accept it also because you don't have the technical. Uh, knowledge yet to accept it, right? Uh, and I believe this will be an argument used by many business like next month because just like you know they didn't have time to do it even if they wanted to just because it's it's hard to integrate lightning um, but i believe you know this argument will only work for some time right so if as a large business you know in a year you don't accept lightning uh, this is where maybe the law maybe there will be some you know more enforcement by the government and whether it's good or not i don't know like i, I think bitcoin uh, if it starts as a bottom-up project, is great. You know, top-down is you not know, to be seen. What is how people perceive it, and it's becoming a very political, I guess, uh, discussion point here. Like uh, because so, you know, before the law, like Bitcoin was very apolitical. Like people like it or not for what it is. Uh, and now there's a lot of people saying you know if if i don't like the president i'm against this party for whatever reason uh, I, i'm against you know bitcoin because I, I don't want to have the money of the president which is very um uh, <laughs> funny to think like this because you know at its core bitcoin is very apolitical but like here it's becoming a what whether you are affiliated with the current government or not you have different stance on bitcoin uh, yeah, it's very interesting. We've had other things here, like the mask was a very apolitical thing. You know, it protects you from diseases. They wear it in hospitals. And now it's like a big political thing. Uh, the same thing, Bitcoin has even become political here the last couple of days as they fight over the infrastructure bill. And a lot of senators have had to come out and say, hey, you know, we don't, we don't really understand Bitcoin, but we think it might be the future of innovation. And we don't want that to leave our country. Uh, so it's interesting to hear that in El Salvador, that if you're supporting the president or not supporting the president you might be uh, on one side or the other with bitcoin because like you said before you were kind of like the plucky leb uh, they're plucky rebels down there on the beach you know a little rebel party and then pretty soon this top-down law from the president comes in uh kind of changes everything uh what's the general reaction are people like they hear about the bitcoin and they're like oh this is good are they going to be out there waving flags on the september day when they turn over or are they kind of like, you know, technical people are overthrowing us and we like our old money and our old ways? Uh, how much resistance is there? Yeah, there's a, a little bit of everything. I, I believe overall, uh, most people don't really understand what Bitcoin is yet. Um, it's something that suddenly they have to care about, but like, it, it takes time right to know what bitcoin is and it takes years right uh, um, most people i know like they um, even if you understand it either from the technical side or from the economic side like you know to, to really understand what bitcoin is you don't get it in three months right especially if well, you have that's, no interest that's even in just normal bitcoin let alone lightning network and layer two and all of these concepts right yeah so what i get from many meetings with whether it's the government um, or banks or you know merchants is that 
I think they are optimistic about what Bitcoin can bring, but they're also confused on what it is and how different it is and how, if they don't, you know, what does it mean to have a volatile currency and how they can edge about it and what will be the cost and, you know, all kind of questions, right? So, so right now, I think one of the key things that we can do, you know, is a, in the Bitcoin community to make sure El Salvador succeed is to, to do a lot of education right here in the space. Well, it's amazing every time you send a transaction and it goes through and you think about how that works, you know, no third party, no centralized server, you know, everything else you do on the internet, you send to a server and it sends you back the thing. But there's other times where you send a transaction and it's stuck or you didn't pay enough fees or the blocks are slowed down and there's no one you can call and there's no human you can go to. And if you send it to the wrong address or if you send it to the, uh, the different currency, like there's different versions of, of Bitcoin and all this now, different ways to lose your money, uh, there's no one to call. And it, it must not be comforting for the banks and the businesses and the other people to understand uh, this kind of system. Yes, you cannot call Bitcoin CEO to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> I want a refund. Come on. Where's my refund? And it's something people hear sometimes, like, you know, when they use a wallet. And um, yeah, sometimes they don't understand that, no, it's not like the fiat system. Like, you know, we, we, when the money is sent, like, it's after that, it's out of our control, right? And it's something people have to learn. I watched a really interesting video recently about these uh, rappers on the internet and the things they rap about is uh, how to steal credit cards. And they are all like stealing credit cards and making money. And what they say is that it's a victimless crime and that it doesn't hurt anyone, right? Because the credit card company just pays the person back every time they get stolen. But that's what creates this attitude towards credit cards and towards money and that it's not real and that you can just keep damaging someone and it won't hurt them or you can keep spending it and it's not there. With Bitcoin, it is very real. If you send it to the wrong place, if you make a mistake, if you buy something and you shouldn't have, or if you support someone and you give too much money to a political donation or whatever, that money's gone. There's no way to reverse it. It really is kind of adult money. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, and to come back to the credit card aspect, you know, you can think that you know I'm not affecting anyone if I'm trying to abuse the credit card system, but it's wrong. And so, you know, if you think that it's because you have not think through, you know, what the implication of this is. And today the reason credit cards, you know, are charging to the merchants two, three, four, five percent is because it is insurance, you know, you're actually paying for insurance because of the fraud. And what is the repercussion of the merchant having to spend 5% on a credit card transaction is that the merchant is increasing his price by 5%. And so who is affected by that? Everyone, because you know it contributes to the fact that goods and services are more expensive because you need you now as a merchant to account not, not only for everything you need to do, but also to account for this cost of transaction, which is fairly high. And so there is huge implication of, you know, of, of, of the fraud, um, of fraud in, in, in credit card payment. Well, and, uh, and yeah, to hand it to the credit card companies. They did such a good job with their advertising, their marketing that we, we think it's free to spend a credit card anywhere from a consumer perspective. It generally is except interest and all of that. But like you're saying, from a merchant perspective, 5% on every sale and the margins on retail are much smaller than people think a couple of percent here and there. That's whether your store stays open or whether it closes. Yeah, yeah. And so definitively, you know, Bitcoin is like instant finality and when it's on, it's on. Um, and I think that's great as is. Uh, um, that, yes, still the best attribute about Bitcoin is, you know, the first attribute I believe is the fact that, you know, you cannot print more of them. Like, I think it's, um, you know, the the best attribute that we have in this space and the second best is yes the, the fact that it's in, it, there is finality to it and um you know because of its finality but no one can gamify it no one have you know control over it um, this is why it's what makes bitcoin so special for sure so what do you have planned for the future of galoy and bitcoin beach uh, anything big coming up with the switchover and the government support? 
So uh, I can talk about you know Galloway what what we're doing as a business. So our goal is to develop open source software that help community run their own bank on Bitcoin. Um, and so everything we do with the Bitcoin Beach Wallet is open source. And you can go on GitHub and go to our Galloy Money Repository and you know see what what we've been developing, right? And so our you know our our, our business is to help any community anywhere in the world to have their own Lightning Wallet, and be able to to do what we have been doing in, in El Salvador, right? And is to launch a local project and hopefully make it grow and show to the community that this is valuable to use Bitcoin, you know, in complement or, uh, you know, instead of like the local currency, it can help financial inclusion. It can help people be educated about sound money. And the goal is, you know, everyone in the world to have this seed that will go and hopefully become profitable business in the future. And so there is a lot of other places in the world that you know um, will benefit from that. And we are talking with 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 entrepreneurs all across Latin America that would want to also launch um, something similar. Um, but we also obviously focus on making sure the growth of the Bitcoin Beach Wallet um, is is successful. So there is a lot more user every day that use the wallet with the law coming into effect. Um, we may have. I don't know, a million users in, in six months or a year, and we want to make sure like this course is winning smooth. Well, that sounds great. And I, I think that the localized version of the Bitcoin wallet can really make all the difference because you're already asking someone to accept this weird currency from the internet. The least you could do it is ask them in their own language with buttons that they understand and cultural icons and other things you don't want to use an offensive color or things like this. Having people on the ground that know the people I think can help uh, get through some of those barriers and lead to more Bitcoin adoption. Yeah, and I also think that, you know, if there is, you know, a thousand of Bitcoin bank in the world in, in, in five years, it will be, will be in, a much, in a much better space, uh, much more decentralized versus if, if there is five big actions that control all the flow, right? Uh, and, and part of the goal of this project is to make sure like, Everyone can have their own small bank that you know doesn't need to have hundred million user. One of the reasons is because if we bring the cost down to creating a new wallet to zero, then you know anyone can really, you know, start their own project and just compete on the merit of maybe marketing or support or um, some other factor, but not necessarily the cost of developing the wallet, right? Not, not the technical cost. That sounds great. And where can people learn more about Galoy? So our Twitter is Galoy Monet, and my personal handle is Nicolas Berthe. All right. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for being on the show. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me today.